Okay, I, uh, I want to focus your attention this morning on Psalm 18. I'm going to read three verses, Psalm 18, verses 16 through 19. Psalm 18, verses 16 through 19. David, King David wrote this psalm. Verse 16, he reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. They attacked me at a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. So it's Father's Day, as you know, and it's part six in this series called Knowing Grace. And Father's Day falls at the perfect time for me in this series. Because for me, the words grace and father go hand in hand for two reasons, primarily. The first reason is because I had an amazing dad who embodied grace. He died in 2010, and he was one of my very best friends, my greatest encourager. Uh, I miss him every day I think about him. There are certain songs that I can listen to that he loved that still make me cry every time I hear them. He was amazing. Nothing taught me more about grace than the way my dad loved me. Nothing especially when I didn't deserve it. And there were plenty of times I did not deserve his love. I could tell you a hundred stories, and I've told you some over the years, but I could tell you a hundred stories about specific moments when I deserved my dad's anger, when I deserved my dad's disappointment, but instead got a hug or a word of assurance or a word of promise or a word of encouragement. He was wise, so wise, smart. He was born and raised in Switzerland and was educated over there and then got married to my mom and moved over here and ended up getting his PhD at Marquette University in educational psychology, moved his entire family from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, down to Coral Springs in 1978 to open a private practice with his friend Larry Crabb. Um, Wise, smart, incredibly smart. not only in an academic sense, but in a down-to-earth kind of way. He had remarkable emotional intelligence. He loved people more than anybody I'd ever met in my life. He was born to be a therapist. He was uh, encouraging, incredibly patient. I'm one of seven kids. My dad was incredibly patient. He was affectionate, so affectionate. Um, I mean, every time, even as a grown man, every time I would walk in the door, he would come over to our place. He always hugged me and kissed me on both cheeks. Um, He was incredibly affectionate, held our hands. He wasn't afraid to show affection. In that sense, he was a real man's man. He was funny as hell. I mean, ridiculously funny, super funny, Uh, constantly had us laughing. He was incredibly empathetic. He could not only sympathize with what you were going through, but he could empathize with what you were going through. He had some hard things that he lived through in his own life, which made him empathetic. My grandmother, his mother-in-law, used to say that he had listening eyes, and he did. He really did. My most vivid recollection of my dad was the look of pure delight on his face every time one of his kids walked into the room. Pure delight. Uh, I remember specifically a time when he and my mom and my grandparents, my mom's parents, went away to St. Martin for 10 days on vacation. And at that point, I had only known my dad with a beard. When I came into this world, he had a beard. For the first, I don't know, eight, nine years of my life, he had a beard. 
And we were all excited that mom and dad were coming home on that particular night. And my brother Arm and I were already in bed. We shared a room. We were already in bed. But we saw the, the lights sort of through the blinds. A car was pulling up. We knew it was my mom and my dad. And so we excitedly jumped up out of bed and went out of our room. And as we were making our way down the hall, my dad turned the corner and he looked at us beardless. He looked like a complete stranger to me, but he had a smile from ear to ear and he got down on both of his knees and just opened his arms and both of us ran into his arms. He's that kind, he was that kind of guy. Uh, always remarkably delighted, excited to see his kids every time we walked in the door or he came home. Um, I remember him telling his secretary, uh, I mean, forever, if any of my children, he would see like eight patients a day, and he gave her strict instructions, if any of my children come to the office for whatever reason, interrupt me every time. I mean, I remember walking into his office after school because I needed some money or something, and uh, I, would, I would walk up to the counter, and she would say, hold on a second. She would alert my dad that I was there, and instead of my dad coming out, he would have me come in so he could introduce me to his patients. He was always so proud, always so proud. This is my son, Tullian, and he goes to this school, and this is what he likes, and he would describe me to his patients. Um, I'll never forget, I've shared this story before, but we used to vacation in Marco Island as a family when I was young, and it was 1984, a Karate Kid had just come out, I had seen it, and for the first time in my life, I knew what I was called to do. I was called to be a karate person, whatever they call them. Um, and I was obsessed with learning karate, obsessed. And at that time, I mean, I was going through phases every two weeks. Uh, I went through a breakdancing phase. I went through a John Rambo phase. I went through every, ama every imaginable phase you could think of, I went through. And for these two weeks, while we were in Marco Island, I was in my karate phase. And I remember being, it was low tide, it was late in the afternoon, and I was out in the ocean with my dad. Um, I was basically up to my waist because we were, because the water was so shallow, and my dad was on his knees, and we were talking, just the two of us, and I was going on and on and on and on about how I wanted to learn karate, how I needed to learn karate, how I was obsessed with karate, and my dad could have said, listen, two weeks ago, you were obsessed with Transformers, two weeks before that, you were obsessed with John Rambo, two weeks before that, you were obsessed with breakdancing, he didn't, he just listened and listened, like really listened, like he was seriously taking me seriously. Um, and after I finished my little speech, my sales pitch on why he should pay for me to get karate lessons, uh, he said to me, listen, when we get home from vacation, the first thing you and I are going to do is find a karate dojo and the best one that you want to go to and we'll sign you up, which of course we never did because by the time we left Marco, I wasn't into karate anymore. But the very fact that he would sit there and just listen and engage me seriously and not treat me like I was some little kid who was just going through another phase. He was an amazing man, full of grace, full of truth. He was a man of grace. So that's the first reason that the words grace and father go hand in hand for me. I had a, a dad who was full of amazing grace and was incredibly gracious to me. But the second reason the words grace and father go hand in hand for me is because I'm a dad. Um, my three kids are a gift of grace upon grace to me. Huge gift. Throughout my life, I have struggled at times with wanting to be a son, with wanting to be a brother, with wanting to be a husband, with wanting to be a friend, but I have never struggled for one second with wanting to be a dad to Gabe and Nate and Jenna. From the moment each of them came into this world, we've been close. Parenting has had its share of challenges over the years, but being a dad has not been hard for me. It's not been hard. It's been my life's deepest joy since I became one nearly 30 years ago. Being a dad 
to my three kids continues to be an amazing gift of grace, amazing gift of grace. But like my dad, Gabe, Nate, and Jenna have embodied grace to me, especially when I deserve their judgment, especially. I want to read something to you that I wrote a number of years ago. Of everything I've ever written, and I don't know how many tens of thousands of words I've written over the years, but of everything that I have ever written, this is the hardest thing for me to still read. June 19th, 2015, is a day that plagues me still. That was the day I had to sit my three children down and tell them that I had been unfaithful to their mother. It was by far the worst moment of my life. I will never, ever forget the details of that afternoon. They are etched in my memory as if it happened 20 minutes ago. The looks on their faces, their words, their tears. To this day, every particular of that Friday afternoon haunts me. Jenna was the first to speak. With a look of utter sadness, shock, and disappointment, she said, Dad, why? Why? Why did you do this? I trusted you. You're my dad. We're supposed to be best friends. Nate, in typical Nate fashion, didn't say a word. He looked down with his lip quivering, and then got up and walked out the front door. Then Gabe, my eldest, spoke, my firstborn, holding his brand new baby boy, my grandson Mason, with his wife Jamie sitting next to him. He gazed at me with a look of anger and deep sadness and said, I've always looked up to you. You are my dad. You are my mentor. I tell everyone that you are my mentor. Dad, I can't believe you did this. Dad. At that time, all three of my kids were already in a very fragile place. Jenna was heading into her final year of middle school. Nate had just graduated from high school and was headed off to college. And Gabe had just started his family. Never had they needed their dad more. And I was, I was now delivering further hurt into their already delicate lives. All three of my kids grew up in a tight-knit, fun-loving home. From the moment they came into this world, their mother and I loved them as best as we could. We persistently pointed them to God, but humanly speaking, we were their foundation, their security. I had done my best to protect them, comfort them, provide for them, bear their burdens, teach them, and make them laugh. The fact that I had now failed them, crushed them, and forever altered their lives is a guilt-ridden ache I will never outlive. Since that Friday, many years ago, we've had a lot to work through. We've had the hard conversations. We've cried the hard tears. And thankfully, through it all, we've remained undetachably close and deeply connected. I deserved to lose the love and affection of my kids forever, but their love for me has never blinked, not even for a second. I have apologized to each of them a hundred times over the years, and they have tenderly reminded me over and over and over again that they forgive me. I delivered pain into their lives, and they delivered pardon into mine. I wrote a book titled One Way Love, but my children are the ones who have lived it and given it. My children are grace to me, all three of you. You know, if uh, God, yes, thank you, honey. Is, is, did, you, did you use this? Huh? <laughs> looks used. What? I just, it, it looks a little used, honey. Uh, <laughs> it's a little soiled. Um, If God had not given me the dad or the kids that he gave me, I I know he would have taught me about his love for me in other ways. I know. 
But in my case, it's been my dad and it's been my kids who for decades, decades now, have taught me everything I know about the way God loves me. Everything. So when Psalm 18 says, he reached down from heaven and rescued me, he drew me out of the deep waters, he led me to a place of safety, he rescued me because he delights in me, I have an earthly picture of what that means. I know what that looks like. I've experienced that from those people in my life. My dad delighted in me. I delight in my kids. My kids delight in me. And none of that delight has anything to do with how they perform or how they behave. My dad loved me because he loved me. I love my kids because I love them. Full stop. That's how God loves us. He doesn't love us because we're good. He doesn't love us because we're strong. He doesn't love us because we're even lovable. He loves us because he loves us regardless of how we behave or perform. He delights in us. But I'm also acutely aware that Father's Day is very painful for many people. My friend Bruce just lost his dad. We just had his funeral service here a week ago. I know that Father's Day is hard for people, lots of people. I have good friends who have been hurt traumatically by their dads. Abused in a variety of different ways. I know there are people in this room who have never heard their dad say, I love you, ever. Dads who have been physically present but emotionally absent. I also know there are dads in this room whose kids haven't spoken to them in years. A pain that I cannot even imagine, cannot imagine. If that were the case for me, I'd rather die. I can't imagine that pain. I know dads who live with a ton of guilt and shame and regret because of how unavailable they were to their kids. And as they reflect back on their life, there's an overwhelming sense of guilt and shame and regret. They pursued their profession more than their children when they were growing up, and they live with that ache. They live with that regret. Even my granddad, at the end of his life, told me that his biggest regret was that he was gone so much and wasn't available to his kids when they were growing up. His biggest regret. He was in his 90s when he told me that. I also know there are men in this room who desperately want to become dads and haven't been able to yet. That's a, that's a pain. I also know dads who have lost their children to addiction I know dads who have lost their children to prison, and I know dads who have lost their children to death. So in my case, the words grace and father go hand in hand, but for many, the word father is painful. It's triggering, traumatizing, it's hurtful. The word father, if that's you, the word father is more ungrace than grace. To these people, Father's Day sucks. And I get that. But whether father conveys grace or ungrace, whether the word father is a delightful word or a depressing word, we all intuitively know what we long for a father to be. We all know that. All of us. All of us have clear ideas of what, of what a father should and shouldn't be. Who a father should be. We know, for instance, that a father should love and protect his children. We know that a father should provide for his children, that his children should feel safe and secure around him, that dad should be the anchor, the strong one, the glue. We all want that. If we don't have that on our own dads, we look for that in other people. We know that 
A good father encourages his children, delights in his children, makes sacrifices for his children, and is available for his children. We know that a good father is grace to his children. We know that's what we want. We know that's what we long for, down deep. So whether our dads are like that or not, or whether we've been like that or not, if we are a dad, that's what we long for. It's what we want. It's the kind of person we want in our lives in that primary spot. And for many, that's just not the case. For some it is. For many it's not. But for all of us, that's exactly who God is. Exactly. Isaiah refers to God as an everlasting father. That is a phrase pregnant with meaning. A father who protects and provides and loves and comforts and encourages without interruption, everlastingly, that's who he is. He's a father who is everlastingly safe. A father who promises that he'll be there for us no matter what, regardless of how we perform, regardless of how we behave. Wherever we are, he is there. Wherever we go, he goes too. Whether it's to good places, bad places, places of light or places of darkness, he never leaves us, ever. He's a father who delights in us, who cheers us up, and one whose whole face lights up every time we walk through the door. Every time. He's a father who sacrifices for us, gives and gives and gives and gives, and never asks for anything in return. What is Psalm 51? The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. That's it. We come to him with empty hands, dirt under our fingernails. Sometimes our heads hung in shame. And he never pushes us away, never tells us he doesn't want to see us. He's there no matter what. Someone once said years ago, and I've shared that here, that religion says, I'm in trouble. I got to get away from my dad. Uh, Christianity says, I'm in trouble. I got to call my dad. Big difference. That's who God is. A father with listening eyes who hears our cries, wipes our tears, and never stops reminding us that the hard things won't last forever. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Always. He's always working for us. He's always good to us. In fact, Romans tells us that he is working all things, even the bad things, especially the bad things. He's working all things out for our good, whether you can sense it, see it, feel it or not. He's constantly working for your good. He's constantly working to set you free, constantly. Um, He's a He's an empathetic father who never, never gets annoyed by our pains, by our repeated failures. He never gets annoyed by our insecurities or our fears or our ongoing anxieties. He's proven himself to us time and time and time again, and we doubt him time and time and time again, and that never annoys him, never He never looks at us and says, I'm done with you. Have I not proven myself to you? Have I not shown you that I'm going to be there for you, that I'm going to be faithful to you, that I'm going to take care of you, and yet you still worry? You still get anxious? You still doubt me? I'm done with you. Never. Words you will never hear from God. I'm done with you. I've had enough. Um, He's attentive. Oh, man, is he attentive. (laughs) So attentive. He notices all the things that no one else notices. Always. 
I don't know if my mom will like me sharing this, but I don't think she'll mind too much. Uh, but a few years ago, we were, my mom was staying with us, and her and, my, her and her dad had a great relationship. She loved her dad. My dad loved her. I was with them on numerous occasions when my grandfather was just doting on her, loving her, encouraging her. Amazing. But my mom was staying with us, and uh, Jenna walked out of her room, and I was standing in the kitchen, and I remarked how much I liked Jenna's nail polish and toenail polish and how it l really looked pretty and how I liked that particular color on her for this particular reason. Just the two of us talking, but my mom was eavesdropping, and she turned around. We didn't know she was listening, and she turned around, and she was just kind of mesmerized by this short little conversation Jenna and I were having in the kitchen. And she said, I, uh, I don't ever remember my dad noticing my nail polish or my toenail polish or talking about the color of my nails ever. And I thought for a minute in that moment that God notices everything. And I don't mean that in some scary way like, He's what Jesus is watching you. Watch every move you make. I'm not talking about it in that sense. I mean, he notices every little ache, every little pain, every little effort, every little movement of progress, everything. He notices that stuff. He's, he's attentive to that stuff. He's detailed in what he notices. He notices all the things no one else notices and who will never, ever tell us to come back later because he's too busy. He's uninterruptible, uninterruptible. He's a father you can tell your most embarrassing secrets to and never be embarrassed. He won't judge you. He's undisappointable, undisappointable. He loves his children unconditionally. He is reliable He's trustworthy, he's faithful, he's stable, he's honest, he's strong, and he is the best friend I have ever had, ever. Someone asked me a couple years ago, in light of everything you've gone through over the last 10 years, what is something you've learned about God or learned of God that maybe you didn't know before? And my immediate response was his friendship. Immediate. That God is a friend. He's a friend to sinners. He's a friend. He's not an enemy. He's not an antagonist. He's a friend. He's a friend who doesn't blink. A friend who doesn't bail. A friend who doesn't walk away when things get messy. When I went through everything I went through, I thought at the time I had a lot of friends. But I didn't. When things got really messy, when things got dirty, when things got ugly, I discovered I had very few friends. So I started to understand something about friendship that I didn't understand before. I understood that I didn't have as many friends as I thought I had. I understood that I was not the kind of friend that I thought I was. I, I understood that I didn't love my friends as much as I thought I did, and they didn't love me as much as I thought they did. And in that moment, when I felt alone and friendless, God proved that he's the best friend anyone could ever have, ever. He's a father who is also a friend, an everlasting father who is also an everlasting friend. Think about what... Friendship is, friendships that you've lost, friendships that you treasure, what you long for in a friend, what kind of person is that? That's who God is. He's undisappointable, he's reliable, he's honest, he's forgiving. Forgiving, his forgiveness has no ceiling. His is a 70 times 7 kind of forgiveness. He never holds a grudge, ever. He never reminds us of the ways in which we failed. In fact, he's forgotten those things. The sins we can't forget, God doesn't remember. 
My sin is cast into the sea of God's forgotten memory. As far as the east is from the west, he's cast our sins from us, and he remembers them no more. Remembers them no more. He's everlastingly forgiving. It's not as if we make the same mistake over and over and over again. We go to the same dry cisterns over and over and over again. We keep indulging the same bad habits over and over and over again. And regardless of the horizontal consequences that we suffer, we never seem to learn our lesson. And it's never as if God goes, I'm done. I'm finished with you. I have given you chance after chance after chance after chance. I've given you more chances than anyone on planet Earth would have ever given you, and I'm, I'm finally done. I'm done. That's why I don't like the phrase that God is the God of second chances. I mean, I get the sentiment behind it, and I can appreciate that. But in my case, and in your case, and in everybody's case, we need a hell of a lot more than a second chance. Way more. I mean, I'd much rather say God is the God of one chance and a second Adam. One who came for us and did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And as a result of reconnecting us to God, we will never, ever be unforgiven. Ever. Our forgiveness is here It's now and it's forever. He never holds a grudge. He never reminds us of our failings, ever. So when it comes to God and who God is, grace and Father are interchangeable terms. So whether you had a dad like mine, whether you are a dad like mine or not, um, we all want... The fathers, the father figures, our, our real fathers, our stepfathers, our biological fathers, the, the fathers that God has put in our life, the father figures that God has put in our life. We want people to be dependable, reliable, trustworthy, loving, kind, affectionate, forgiving, safe, secure, all of that stuff. And I don't care if you're the best dad in the room. I don't care if you had the best dad on planet Earth. You didn't because I did. But I don't care um, whether that's the case or not. We fail each other. I said I've, I've loved my kids since the moment they were conceived. Well, I mean, I didn't know the moment they were conceived. But, you know, when I found out that the baby was coming, I loved them. Um, and I've loved them every second of their lives, but I've failed them. And if you're a dad, you've failed your kids. If you're a kid, your dad has failed you. Uh, Father figures in your life have failed you. Humans fail humans. We are broken people, every single one of us. None of us can be for one another what only God can be. It's impossible. Your husband can't be that way, your friends can't be that way, your wife can't be that way, your moms, your dads, your grandparents, your colleagues, no one can be for you what God has promised to be. No one. No one is as reliable. No one is as trustworthy. No one is as safe. No one is as secure. No one is as forgiving. No one is as loving. No one. That is a spot reserved for God and God alone. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John says this, See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Children of God. Think about that. All of the benefits and the blessings that come our way because we are God's kid. We are children of God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, the one who gives us air to breathe, the one who helps us, the one who provides for us, the one who brought us into being. This is our father. We get to call him Abba, Father, Dad. We are children of God. The late theologian J.I. Packer said, there is 
singularly no more glorious doctrine in all of the Bible than the doctrine of adoption. That sinners, messy, broken down, failed people like you and me are adopted by God delightfully. He chose you to be in his family. You. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he wasn't thinking generically about humanity. He was thinking about you. You. Who you are. And he knew that thousands of years later, when the time was right, he was going to bring you into being. And he brought families together who begat children. And those children begat more children. And those children begat more children until it got to you. And he fashioned you in exactly the way he wanted you to be. We're all unique. We're all different. Every single one of us. We have lots of similarities because we're broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. We have lots of similarities, but we are all unique. Fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist says. He loves you. He wants you. He doesn't begrudge his choice of you. He wants you in his family. He wants to give you gifts. He wants to love you. He wants to forgive you. That's why I said last week, I think it was last week, that when we wander off as we do all the time, when we wander off the reservation, when we get lost foolishly, and God comes after us, he comes after us because he wants to. He doesn't come after us with a belt. He comes after us with a hug, puts us over his shoulder and carries us back home time and time and time and time again. He's that kind of a dad. A dad, you know, I, I told uh, my brother, one of my brothers this a few weeks ago. I have no recollection of my dad ever getting really mad at me, ever. Now, he spanked me. That's when spanking was legal, I guess. Uh, he spanked me, and I don't begrudge him for that. I deserved way more spankings than I got. I can promise you that. Um, he and my mom spanked us very differently. Okay? My mom was frantic in her spanking. She grabbed whatever she could find and just started swinging. <laughs> my dad, on the other hand, the wise psychologist that he was, would always say, now you know, he it's thick European accent, you know I have to spank you, so go to your room and I'll be there in a minute. He was always very calm. And I would go and I would put on like six pairs of underwear. I swear to God, I would put on every pair that was in my drawer, an extra pair of shorts. <laughs> he knew it. I think that's why he gave us a little lead time. He knew we were preparing. And he gave us that grace to prepare for the beating that was to come. And then he would say, Okay, I would literally like sort of bend over the bed and he would say, okay, I'm going to spank you twice. And then he would, you know, like, bam, bam, you know, spank me twice. And then he, when he was finished, he would put me on his, he would put me on his lap every time or sit next to me on the bed once I got older. Um, and he would put his arm around me, remind me of how much he loved me and pray with me every time. Now, if you're going to spank your kid, that's the way to do it, okay? Seriously. Um, my, my kids got spanked all the time, and I don't think their experience was anything like my experience was with my dad. Uh, Jenna, I don't think, ever got spanked once. I think one time I kind of like slapped her hand, and I felt terrible about it. Um, Gabe got the worst of it. I, I was a young dad. Gabe got the worst of it. He's still recovering from the trauma of the spankings he got from me. I tapered off a little bit with Nate. By the time we got to Jenna, I had written off spanking altogether. Um, but, uh, but my other, I don't, even when I was being spanked, I never remember my dad being angry, ever. That is a beautiful picture of who God is. Beautiful. And I was gifted that in my own dad. And I know a lot of people weren't. I get that. But for me, that was such a beautiful picture. It remains a beautiful picture of how God loves us, all of us. He's not angry. He's not mad at you. My friend Steve Brown has been saying this for 50 years. God is not mad at you. He adopted you, he loves you, he's not mad at you. 
So my dad, even in the way he disciplined us, he did it in love, without anger, without wrath. That's who God is. We are children of God. That is who we are. That is what we are. So let me just, I just want to close with this. Um, I want to, I mentioned at the beginning that Father's Day and Mother's Day sermons were very different in the churches that I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in some good churches, but they were very different. Fathers were always sort of spanked, you know, on Father's Day, like you need to be doing more, you need to be more present, you need to be loving more, you need to be more affectionate, you need to be more, all that stuff. And mothers were just spoken of, like I said before, as if they were sinless angels, like they had never done anything wrong, which was ironic because uh, uh, my dad was a lot nicer than my mom for the most part. <laughs> And you know that to be true, Mom. I know you're watching. Now, just to give my mom, uh, you know, sort of to make it clear, she had to deal with us a lot more than my dad did, okay? A lot more. So her patience, wore. if my dad had to be with us as often as my mom had to be with us, I don't think I would be saying some of the things I've been saying this morning about him, okay? So I get that. Um, but, uh, but I was always frustrated by church services and sermons that seem to glorify moms and vilify dads. So, I want to say a final word to all the fathers who have failed, which is all fathers, all of us. And to all the fathers who live with regret because of mistakes you made with your kids, which is all fathers, every father. God loves and forgives you. He does not count your sins against you. His fatherly love toward you does not depend on your success as a dad. It does not. It is not a conditional kind of love. He loves broken fathers who fail because there aren't any other kinds of fathers. So whether you live with regret as a dad, or you live with pain because of your dad, or you wish you had a dad that was more like God, regardless, God is an everlasting father. He's the one we long for. He's the one our hearts ache for. He's that person. He's our person. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your everlastingness as our Father. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your ongoing goodness. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that your grace is amazing, that your forgiveness is forever that your love is unconditional, and that we are yours come hell or high water. That there's nothing we can do or fail to do that will make you love us more or less. You love us because you love us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.